in February 1935, the Anglo Montreal journalist C. Holmes wrote two analytical notes on the position of French Canada in the ballet of Canadian Confederation. Those notes were originally intended for publication in the Montreal Gazette, but were, however, incorporated directly into the notes of Ambassador Brugère, uh, the French ambassador in Canada. The, um, in those notes, we can read the following statement, which is particularly interesting to me. It is not entirely up to us to learn to better appreciate the French Canadians that we have in the past and, realize, and realizing the future of Canada is largely in their hands, show that we wish them to involve freely and untrammeled by restraining influences so that their race may play as important a part of this side of this, uh, on this side of the ocean as the French nation has played in continental Europe. So the Montrealer's good-natured attitude and his francophile position seem to have seduced the Quai d'Orsay, even before the actual publication of the Holmes Report, bypassing the embassy's press services, Brugère incorporated those documents into his personal papers. So the diplomat's interest was also apparent in his later notes. On the one hand, Brugère seemed to be paying attention to the view that English Canadians might have on the Confederation in this mid-decade. And on the other hand, the ambassador was certainly interested in Holmes because of his interstitial position between English-speaking and French-speaking communities. The example of Holmes reports is the only one of a large number of documents in French consular and diplomatic archives dealing with Canada, all of which testify on different scales to the fact that English Quebec constitutes a single whole for the Department of Foreign Affairs. And after all, why should it be otherwise? Because indeed, since the Treaty of Paris in 1763, English-speaking Quebec has occupied an elite position within the province, particularly in relation to its predominance in the business and commercial world. This hegemony has certainly been eroded, especially in the decades of the Quiet Revolution of the 1960s. However, um, the 20th century uh, still has, um, still gives a, a, a relatively significant place to this social group within the, within the Quebec society. However, slide no attempt has been to be to, no attempt has been made to place in Quebec's English-speaking community in the context of a history of international relations, and this silence is all the more disturbing given the abundance of diplomatic sources that can be used to punctuate such a narrative, at least on the French side. On the one hand, the work on English Quebec aims to paint a portrait of, of a community occupying a singular position as a minority within the minority from a socio-historical uh, perspective. Uh, this literature does, however, make it possible to establish criteria by which to define what constitutes belonging to English-speaking Quebec, and thus to define one of the tiles of the Canadian mosaic to which Le Quai d'Orsay seems to be paying particular in, uh, attention. So for the purposes of this paper, we're going to stick to a definition officially established at the federal level, and we're going to think that an Anglo-Quebecer is an any individual with a principal residence in Quebec and whose mother tongue is English, which does not include plurilingualism. Slide. On the other hand, the, history, the, the historiography of Canadian international relations, inspired by inspired by work on the history of multiculturalism developed at the national level, has been quite quick to point out the relevance of the principal agent problem in the study of diplomatic relations. Indeed, these ties are not purely and simply disembedded. They are the fact of individuals acting also in the name of their affiliations and their communities, and while they represent a state, the latter does not have absolute control over the depositaries of its authority. Slide. Thus, not only are anglo quebecers structurally in a situation of multiple loyalties between Canada, Quebec, the US, the Commonwealth, Great Britain, and France, but the Quai d'Orsay's attitude towards them is not necessarily as monolithic as one might have assumed. Consequently, we propose here to briefly characterize the nature of relations between France and English Quebec from the end of First World War to the 80s by assessing their specificity. Slide. In order to do so, we have endeavored to identify in a few well-chosen fonts of the French Ministry of Foreign, of Foreign Affairs, English-speaking um, Quebecers mobilized in one way or another in the construction of diplomatic ties between France and Canada. While the numbers are real, they're not abundant, and they're dominated by a few figures from Quebec's Anglophon community who have remained key interlocutors to the Quai d'Orsay over long periods of time. Since, for the moment, we haven't yet had access to Canadian sources, we'll confine ourselves here to identifying the position of the Department of Foreign Affairs towards a structurally powerful community and to shaping the balance of the space that the Quai d'Orsay is seeking to establish as the preserve of French foreign policy, Quebec. Uh, 
So I'm going to start with the first part of, um, of this presentation and focus on the period that goes from the 20s to uh, the beginning of World War II, slide seven. First of all, during the 20s, the French-Canadian diplomacy is still in its infancy. In the twilight years of, of First World War, the ties between France and Canada were still very much in the process of being formalized. Although the Canadian Commissariat in Paris has been uh, operating since 1882, its work was marginal and closely supervised by London, which had complete latitude in the regulian affairs of its dominion. In such a context, it was on the Ottawa side that there was a desire to develop a diplomacy aimed at France out of a desire from, for emancipation from the crown. So the first commissioner was sent to Paris were Hector Fabre and Philippe Roy, both French Canadians who, represented, who represented the province of Quebec as much as Confederation. And on the French side, the Quai d'Orsay faced a twofold difficulty. Not only was the, maintain the maintenance of diplomatic relations with Canada likely to cause the British to feel uncomfortable, but French Canadians were not unanimous in their support. Some people were indeed skeptical about France's abandonment of the abandonment of Quebec, this expression referring to France's return to Canadian affairs and even more so to Quebec affairs after a long period of neglect that lasted throughout the 19th century. So for all these reasons, the Franco-Canadian ties were, that were forged in the first part of the 20th century were mainly economic in nature and didn't exclusively or primarily concern Quebec. Although French ambassadors to Canada, particularly Gruget, understood the potential that a transatlantic French fact represented for the power of France, this wasn't accompanied by a cultural policy that was systemized or set by the, by the so-called Direction d'Amérique. Slide. It is the consular level that best enables us to understand how these economic relations were built. Correspondence between the local chargé d'affaires and the department's central offices beginning in the early 20s testifies to the Quai d'Orsay's growing interests in Canadian natural resources, for example. In the West, Paul Suzor, in particular, launched a real prospective campaign for French investors. It was cancelled in Vancouver in 1928 for the whole of Western Canada. And they sent 15 reports between 1930 and 1932 containing accurate statistics on the productive profile of the provinces under his jurisdiction, for example. Slide. These overall contextual elements remain valid for Quebec, where a large part of the capital strength is held by the English-speaking business community. It's essentially by virtue of this that they appear in French diplomatic archives, particularly in consular correspondence from Montreal. A consul has been um, in Montreal since 1894, and he was on the front line in making contacts in what was then Canada's leading economic metropolis, at least until the 30s. Moreover, Montreal has become home to an increasingly significant portion of Quebec's English-speaking population as the century progressed. And the policy of extending economic ties between France and Canada was thus actively supported by the Consul General of France in Montreal, who wanted to bring together Canadian investors and French investors, or Canadian consumers and French consumers, all in very specific markets. And a good example of that is the fur market. So the Montreal market for animal skin, which had prospered since the end of the 18th century, was the source of many English Canadians and French Canadians fortunes, and more uh, precisely two Anglo-Quebec uh, fortunes. And thus, uh, this market drew together a number of influential investors. At the instigation of the Quai d'Orsay, the consulate, headed by Marcel de Verneuil, organized the first Franco-Canadian auction on March 22, 1920. And it's interesting to examine closely how it unfolded as reported in consular correspondence. So this auction was held in the Windsor Hotel in the heart of the city's economic and financial center, and it brought together both French buyers and major Anglo-Montreal tycoons, such as Thomas Shaughnessy, Herbert Hall, and Robert Coltert. And in addition to the consular presence and individual presence on the on behalf, Two decisive institutions uh, in Montreal's economic life were present, the French Chamber of Commerce of Montreal, from in 1986, and the very powerful Anglophone Montreal Board of Trade. These two emanations of the French and English-speaking business communities, which had been maintaining a latent rivalry, uh, were brought together here through a representative of the French government who accentuated the trend by organizing such sales on an annual basis for the decade. And in such circumstances, it's indeed economic interest that seems to take precedence over cultural or community proximity. Slide. We are going now to focus on a case study uh, to study the, the relation between Anglo-Quebec and Quai d'Orsay. And this is uh, the Jacques Cartier's 400th birthday. 
The policy of the K remained very consistent throughout the 20s and the 30s, particularly during the mandate of René Turc, whose bilingualism and charisma won over the Montreal financial community. However, this in no way prevented the, depart the department, so the Département uh, d'Amérique, from finding itself in a, paradox in a paradoxical position with respect to the English-speaking Quebec. Its cultural policy, still, still in sentency, remained entirely focused on the French-Canadian core in contrast to its economic stance. Truk himself claimed to be obsessed with propaganda in French language in accordance with the ideas of the boss, so so-called ideas of the boss, I quote, Louis Bartou. Nevertheless, the Direction d'Amérique seemed to be mindful of the need to appeal jointly to the influential uh, spheres of the two solitudes, French-Canadian French and Anglo-Canadian, which still constitute the whole of Quebec society in its, in its eyes. So to show this, let's look at its role during the, uh, the Mission Jacques Cartier, which is a high point in the building of franco canadian ties in the 30s. To celebrate the 400th anniversary of Jacques Cartier's arrival in the Girl of St. Lawrence, two national comedies, one Canadian and the other French, were set up on July the 29th, 1933. Both expressed to the department their desire to organize a Franco-Canadian commemorative cruise, which would take the form of a pilgrimage to places frequented by the explorer. The Quai welcomed the initiative, especially since it was likely to recall France's decisive place in Canadian history only a few years after the Statute of Westminster. So for foreign affairs officials, the event was the perfect opportunity to celebrate the French fact in the Atlantic. This is the position officially defended by one of the great figures of the French comedy, Gabriel Anoto. However, on the Canadian side, we have to note that of the 49 members of the comedy, 24 are French Canadians and 25 are English Canadians. Among them, 10 are Anglo-Quebecers. So thus, they represent more than 20% of the Canadian national comedy. Uh, in recognition of their involvement on August 23, 1934, France awarded the Légion d'honneur to the entire group that had been commissioned to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Jacques Cartier's death. Uh, so if the presence of Anglo-Quebecers on the national comedy is indicative of a particular involvement in Franco-Canadian ties, the fact that they were awarded an honorary decoration is even more so. Indeed, in the 30s, Canadian law prohibited Canadian citizens from receiving a medal issued by another state. While this is a de jure practice, it is only de facto practiced by liberal governments. So in 1934, however, the Canadian parliament was conservative and therefore tolerated the awarding of foreign medals. In 1945, when the activity of both the French and Canadian decoration services increased tenfold due to the end of the war, the irregularity of the decorations awarded at the Jacques Cartier mission was discovered by the Canadian Department of External Affairs. And after arduous negotiation with Bernard de Monton, who was then the French ambassador in Ottawa, the Legends of Honor, the Légion d'honneur, awarded in 1935, were maintained. Such an episode suggests then that the Quai d'Orsay took advantage of a conservative window of opportunity in the mid-30s to seduce a number of influential Anglo-Quebecers who were members of the Jacques Cartier Committee. Let's slide, switch to the second part of, and to the second period I would like to focus on between uh, the beginning of World War II and 1967, which is like a high point in Franco-Canadian history because of the Discours du Balcon uh, de De Gaulle. While um, the search for mutual interest seemed to dominate relations between France and English Quebec in the 20s and 30s, a real turning point came with the outbreak of war. Anglo-Quebecers' position then aligned with that of, French, of English Canadians regarding a general mobilization, uh, which accelerated the rapprochement with the forces of free France. Slide. Throughout the, the conflict, public opinion in English-speaking Quebec was close to that of the majority of in, uh, in English-Canadian circles. On the whole, English-Canadians were generally in favor of conscription, which was massively rejected by French-Canadians. The English-language press, led by the Montreal Gazette, echoed an allegiance to the Commonwealth and the British, which was mixed with a feeling of open sympathy for the representative of, French, of free France. Among the arrangements, Although rare in English-speaking Quebec, this convergence was accelerated by the connivance between certain French-Canadian circles and Pétainism, if not the fascism of one of Adrien Arcan, for example. In any case, although diplomatic relations with Vichy France were severed in 1942, Ottawa welcomed the representative of the French National Comedy under the liberation of, uh, until the, liber the liberation of France. The first of those representatives, Philippe Pierre Ney, was assisted by a secretary acting as an eminence grise for the General de Gaulle, Elisabeth de Miribel. And she was in charge of the information service of this informal embassy and took on important propaganda missions throughout the configuration. 
The Miribel and Pyramid's work for the Free France, they represented found strong support in Western Canada and Ontario, but Quebec was not a, convinced, a, pro, a province concurred in the gold scopes, and the, therefore it was viewed with caution. However, Free France committees were spontaneously set up there, the largest of which in terms of numbers were the Quebec City Committee. And the Anglophone population of the national capital region, like Région de la Capitale Nationale, that is to say Quebec City, is much smaller than Montreal. It's estimated that it represents about 15% of the urban population compared to 25% in Montreal at the same time. However, lists of the members of its Free France Committee have been sent, uh, like have been, have arrived to us, uh, thanks to archives, and all of uh, them have signed a petition of support sent to the National Committee for the Liberation of France on July the 14th, 1942, accompanied by notices from the Miribel services giving a more or less summary biography for each of them. And in the 74 member committee, 32 members were English speaking, so that's, there was a clear overrepresentation. Among them, there were very low, important, significant lo lo local dignitaries, such as the Anglican Bishop of Quebec, uh, F.D. Scott, Percival and Catherine Todor Hortz, who were wealthy industrialists. Slide. The structuring of networks of support for supporting free, free France, largely led by Anglophones, thus catalyzed the proximity between English Quebec and French diplomatic circles. This proximity is also um, visible at the highest level, including the, in the post-war period, and a tandem symbolizes it, the duo um, of De Gaulle and Georges Vanier. For example, we can uh, take this excerpt of a, of a speech he gave in 1947 to showcase this. Um, Vanier completely forgets and detaches uh, himself from his anglophony as well as from his image of uh, Fou de la Reine to state in such a speech Et nous, Canadiens français, avons besoin surtout et plus que jamais de la France. Sans elle, nous ne pourrons pas accomplir notre mission de dépositaire et d'apôtre de la culture française en Amérique. Il est vrai qu'en ce moment, nous sommes un centre de la vie française en Amérique, mais cela ne doit pas nous suffire. Nous voulons davantage. Slide. To this policy of reproachment towards the French, carried by Vanier, responds a policy of reproachment towards Anglo-Québécois, embodied by Vincent Auriol. In 1951, the President of the Republic made a long official visit to North America, which he ended triumphantly in Montreal. On April the 8th, on his last evening across the Atlantic, he gave the following toast in the reception hall of the Ritz-Carlton, where the Union Jack was displayed on a wall. I quote, C'est au nom de cette humanité nouvelle préfigurée par le Canada, c'est au nom de ce bonheur des hommes libres et des peuples libres, qu'à cette heure de notre séparation bouleversée d'émotions par par mon séjour parmi vous, je forme des vœux pour la prospérité du Canada, de la Grande-Bretagne, de la France unie, pour le peuple canadien, pour vous, monsieur l'orateur du Sénat, pour vos collègues du Sénat, du Parlement et du gouvernement, pour Montréal, son honneur le maire, la municipalité, au nom de notre amitié impérissable, de la liberté, de la paix, je lève mon verre en l'honneur de sa majesté, le roi Georges VI. So in front of, the, of an audience of hand-picked guests, where anglo québécois were overrepresented, Oriol sang the praises of a harmony between Canada, Quebec, France, and the UK that would satisfy the pragmatic moderation of Anglo-Quebec public opinion. Slide. Apart from the aspects related to political representation in the 50s and the 60s, the Quai d'Orsay deployed a very vigorous cultural diplomacy towards Quebec, encouraged by the French executive powers, but also by the consular relays that have been calling for the promotion of the French-speaking world on Canadian soil since the end of the 19th century. While French Canadians are, of course, the preferred target of the Quai d'Orsay, especially at the time of the Quiet Revolution, the fact remains that Anglo-Quebecers are not neglected by the American leadership and by the Canadian leadership. In the first place, the Quai d'Orsay could find in the Anglo-Quebec milieu a group sensitive to the seduction of France, seen as a true beacon of civilization. Uh, certainly, the English-speaking elites entrusted the training of their offspring to the most prestigious English-speaking institutions, so through the Montreal Protestant Board of School, then McGill University, and then through British University, Oxford or Cambridge. However, even though French is not mastered, knowledge of French art, French literature, and the French territory remains a particularly valued trait in English-speaking social circles. It was precisely in the name of admiration for the French model that Anglo-Quebecers in the French free comedies of the 1940s became involved. Some 15 years later, these comedies established themselves as effective relays from France to Quebec. The same goes, for example, for Thomas Packett Smith, described as a great friend of France, who visited France on numerous occasions to praise the merits of the foreigner of uh, Laurentian Bank, which he headed. 
France also uh, finds strong support in the person of Robert Tyler Davis, director of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, located on the edge of the Golden Square um, Mine. The Quai d'Orsay also took up the question of language in Montreal, which had been abundantly relayed by consular correspondence since the early 20s. In this regard, the attitude of the Department of Foreign Affairs towards English uh, language educational institution was enlightening. So the case of McGill University is a particularly good example. The French consulate in Montreal works with the Department of French Language and Literature in McGill to promote French culture. From 1947 to 1965, Jean Lemay was its director and was re responsible for a team of teachers, all of French origin, who had met their mark in the French university system. They were usually associate professors in the système secondaire until they were awarded a chair as agrégé. It's very likely that McGill will exclude French Canadians from the recruitment process, thus aligning itself with an American model that emphasizes the importance of the French teacher in social sciences and humanities departments. Explicitly supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs, Jean Lemay proved to be extremely active. He gave lectures at the Rotary Club, invited the consul and his cultural attaché to McGill University. He organized exhibitions in the university's pavilion and created a French summer school. In short, and all in all, through the intermediary of men in the field who weren't not, were not attached to the department, the Quai d'Orsay succeeded in collecting um, cultural diplomacy targeted at the English-speaking population without running the risk of cutting itself from French-Canadian support. Slide. However, it's important not to remain dependent of, on the neuronic vision of the ties between English-speaking France and Quebec in the post four decades. In the 60s, the structuring of a Franco-Quebec diplomacy was very poorly perceived by Anglophone bodies, both in the press and in, financial, in, and in the financial uh, communities. Generally speaking, the emergence of Quebec nationalism, the secularization of, France, of French Canadian group and the separation of the church and the educational communities are sometimes perceived as danger to the Anglophone economic uh, hegemony. This opinion gained in popularity through the 60s and not surprisingly won support following General de Gaulle's 1967 speech from the balcony, le discours du balcon, at the City Hall of Montreal. On this occasion, the positioning of English-speaking classes was identical to that of less the person's position at the federal level. Such an account, which dominates both the historiography of English Quebec and that of relations between France and Quebec at the same time, shouldn't obscure the maintenance of more underground links, though, between English-speaking communities and French diplomacy in the, in the, in the late um, 1960s. These links were obvious during the preparation for the Montreal Works Fair, Expo 67, which was particularly well anticipated by the Quai d'Orsay, pressed by the French ambassador to Ottawa, Raymond Bousquet. So the department sent the Cultural Affairs Directorate to raise funds and establish a program of events to promote France and Quebec. Um, and in particular, Bousquet stressed the importance of building a large scale French pavilion, but this French pavilion was mainly uh, built uh, thanks to uh, Anglo capital and funds. Slide. Let's switch to the last part of this uh, of this presentation uh, and focus on the period running uh, from 1967 to 1988. Uh, during this period, we can see that the relationship between Anglo-Quebec and France is normalized through, through business. During the Quiet Revolution, relations of admiration and trust, but also mistrust, were therefore established between France and English Quebec. The latter prevailed in the twilight of the De Gaulle years and found many extensions when provincial multilingualism was asserted. On the other hand, the dominant position of English speakers in business circles remained a fact taken into account by the Quai d'Orsay, whose pragmatism had in fact led Couve de Murville, Minister des Affaires étrangères for De Gaulle, to dissociate himself from De Gaulle at the end of the Discours du Balcon. With the turn of the 70s, the language issue took on a renewed importance in Quebec and the French diplomatic services were particularly alarmed on two occasions, the, in the emergence of the French Miguel movement and the saint Léonard affair in 1969. While the former is seen as an opportunity to strengthen the province's francophonie, its radical and spontaneous nature is, is of some concern. As for the second, it's much more alarming. The possibility of non-English speaking population by birth, in this case Italian speakers, being able to study in English rather than in French in Montreal is of great concern to consular services. Slide. This political domination uh, situation, sorry, 
which was not conducive to building ties between France and English-speaking Quebec, deteriorated further as the decade progresses. Indeed, in 1976, the victory of René Lévesque's Parti Québécois in the provincial elections marked the beginning of a marked Anglophone exile ratified by the famous Bill 101. 1977. Author Denisot, French consul in Quebec City, wrote to Ambassador Bousquet in 1962 that English-speaking Quebecers no longer feel at home in the province. Demographic now prove it, because between, 1960, uh, between 1976 and 1981, 123,000 Anglophones left Quebec. It must be said that the staff from, of the Quai d'Orsay, in part the Chargé d'Affaires sent to the region, did not help to stem the strand, which was shaped by the attitude of one of the most intransigent Monsieur Quebec of the Fifth Republic, Jean-Daniel Jurgensen, director d'Amérique. Throughout the 1970s, they supported the growth of the nationalist francophonie and helped to reduce the learning of French as a single language. Among new immigrants to Quebec, were also massively encouraged to settle in the province because of the Anglophone hemorrhage. hemorrhage. And this is an offensive strategy theorized by Jean-Paul Palewski as showcased on the slide. Slide 19, everything indicates that an unprecedented degree of freshness is reached between English Quebec and France, which is also evident in the hushed salons of Paris. The strongest tension were certainly noticeable between Jorgensen and Ellen Pattison Black, chargé d'affaires for the Canadian embassy in France between 1967 and 1974. The latter requested nearly five hearings with the, um, with the Direction d'Amérique between 1976, between 1969, sorry, between 19, 67 and 1969 to bring the voice of Ottawa, accusing France of interfering in Canadian affairs by encouraging Quebec sovereignty. Black anglo Quebec extraction was known at the Quai d'Orsay, which in Yugoslav's uh, eyes was enough to completely discredit him as showcased by uh, the statement I reproduced on the slide. Black's final assessment is repeated in all the documents produced by the Direction d'Amérique and it underscores his conception of Quebec society as a resolutely French-speaking society. Slide 20. However, the, the, the 70s were also a time of strong Canadian economic growth, also driven by a Quebec whose natural resources were intensively ex exploited. At the same time, the renewal of French diplomatic teams and especially the establishment of Valérie Giscard d'Estaing and pierre Elliott Trudeau duo in 1974 gradually normalized relations between Ottawa and Paris. These political and economic reasons may explain the development of Canadian consulate in France, mainly between 1971 and 1975. All of them saw their staff increase considerably, particularly those in Bordeaux and Lyon. Numerous administrative positions were created by the federal government. However, they were mostly given to men of Anglo-Quebec extraction, particularly after the arrival of pierre Elliott Trudeau as prime minister. Uh, if we analyze the series of Canadian diplomatic movements in France, it shows that for the year 1974-1975, there was a 48% increase in the number of Anglo-Quebecers in consulate posts. Slide 21. A big permanence remains the links between France and the business community, which is mainly Anglophone in Quebec. During a period of rapid liberalization, contacts between English Quebec and French circles were in fact played at far from embassies and diplomatic representations. From the mid-60s onward, um, both Canadian and French investors came together in transnational circles inspired by the venerable French Chamber of Commerce in Montreal, at Chambre de Commerce Française de Montréal. The most influential was the France Canada Chamber of Commerce, La Chambre de Commerce France Canada, set up by Jean Vinan, the fringes of the Comité France Amérique in 1956. In 1964, it organized the first business lunch on, bringing together top executives of French companies wishing to invest in Canada, such as Pichinet or Hermitid, as well as senior executives from the Canadian financial and banking communities. These lunch ons have been organized on a quarterly basis since 1968 for nearly two decades and systematically bring together between 35 and 45 hand-picked guests. We have several of the guests' attendance list, which makes it possible to establish some statistics and among Canadians' presence between 23% and 36% for anglo Quebecers for the meals organized between 1969 and 1972. So maybe we should see this as a witness to a strength of legacies.
slide. To conclude from this overview of the ties forged between English-speaking Quebec and France over a brief 20th century, let's retain a few salient features which sometimes run counter to what the historiography of French-Canadian relations had set out. First, for the staff of the Quai d'Orsay, English-speaking Quebec exists and deserves to be considered as such within the Canadian mosaic. Consular sources written by men in the field are the best evidence of this. On the other hand, they give a relatively monolithic vision of it. Anglo-Quebecers are mostly perceived as members of a community that, ex that extends English Canada into French Canada. They also constitute an elite group with whom it is important to come into contact because it is powerful, influential, and processing at both the provincial and federal levels. Second, on the Anglo-Quebec side, France is viewed sometimes with suspicion, sometimes with fascination, sometimes with cordiality. In particular, the business community does not seem close um, a priori to the conclusion of partnerships involving France. Tensions and, langu and, um, and linguistic or political discord are set aside when profit comes into play. The changing ties between France and English-speaking Quebec also tell us something about the great game of diplomatic relations established on both sides of the Atlantic. It appears here to be shaped by individuals driven by passion preoccupied by interest, connected by the heart to their communities of belonging, in short, by men uh, that are like men of flesh and blood and not just by the deep forces on which the history of international relations has long been built. Last slide to say thank you. <laughs>